sometimes the way I envision or I, I personally will build up something doesn't right quite match with reality. Hey everybody, welcome back to Career Therapy, the podcast. Today we are starting a new series called Therapist Talks, where we're actually bringing on licensed therapists uh, to share their insights into anxiety, mood, and all sorts of other great things. We've got Dan Mortensen joining us today. Dan is a PhD and the and a lead therapist at Chicago Cognitive Behavioral Treatment Center, specializing in anxiety and mood disorders. And we're going to be talking about these uncertain times and how to deal with uncertainty, especially in your careers, but in life in general, because things are so uncertain with how the world is today. Dan, thank you so much for joining us. Sure, no, it's great to be here, Martin. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And one thing I always love to do when we kick these uh, discussions off is just ask you to tell us about yourself and share a little bit about your background for folks uh, to get the full context of where we're coming from. Sure. No, I'm all about context. So I think that uh, sounds, sounds pretty good to me. So, uh, well, as you said, I'm a, I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and I've been working for um, oh, about over eight years now at uh, the Chicago CBT Center. And uh, uh, you know, kind of what we do is um, we work a lot with, um, well, with cognitive behavioral therapy, and I think we can kind of get into what that is. But for me, it's really just all about uh, understanding patterns. And I work with a lot of different people dealing with anxiety and a lot of other types of issues that come in so that they can really just be able to understand um, some of the patterns of what's going on in their life. And a lot of times it comes down to being able to take different approaches to how they approach emotions or other areas and trying out some new behaviors to try to uh, see if the usual patterns are not working about what else can be done. So that's, that's kind of what I've been doing. And I think especially during the uh, pandemic, uh, it's been all remote, but I've just been, you know, staring at the, the screen and doing that, doing that a whole lot and adjusting myself to all the uncertainty. But in terms of my background, I'm originally from uh, New Jersey. I grew up in the, the suburbs outside of, uh, uh, New York City, and then I went to um, Brown University for for undergrad, and had my uh, time there in uh, Southern New England for a little bit, and went to grad school in in Houston, University of Houston, and uh, it was uh, a pretty interesting experience being there because that's uh, I didn't realize until I got there that that's the largest medical center in the world. And so oh, wow. I got to be involved in just about any kind of clinic or getting experience in, in treatment of all sorts of different psychological issues. Uh, it was there. So it was a little bit of a kid in a candy store uh, type thing in terms of getting trained as I was able to do a lot there. And I worked for my internship, which is kind of the final step of the PhD at uh, Baylor College Medicine. And, uh, you know, really got to specialize a lot more uh, in CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, and, you know, went a lot more in depth, which I then expanded upon when I came to Chicago about nine years ago, uh, initially at Northwestern Memorial at the, the hospital fellowship program there, and then uh, hopped on board with the practice where I've been doing this for, um, you know, the better, better part of a decade now. But um, it just, I think that for me, it's, I, I love connecting with people of all sorts of different ages and love working with all sorts of combinations of issues. And uh, I don't know, for me, it just kind of fits with how, how my brain works. And that's usually, by the way, that phrase there is what I often say with people I work with, especially those that are, you know, trying to figure out what they want to do with their lives or career wise is that it's, it's really about finding the combination of behaviors and ways of approaching things that fit with how your brain works. So when you're doing that, you know, for several hours a day, then it just, it just kind of fits. Your brain is happy when you're in that mode. I love that. And thank you so much for sharing your background. We got a lot of great expertise uh, in your history to pull from. So I'm really excited to get into the conversation here. Um, sure. When we're talking about doing things that fit with how your brain works, I think the first thing that comes to my mind is how, how people struggle with the job search because it doesn't necessarily fit with how their, their brain works. You know, we work with developers, we work with people that aren't necessarily social. I hear all the time, well, I'm, I'm an introvert. I, I, don't, I don't network. What is this thing? And I think sometimes the job of the job search doesn't really fit with how people's brains work. Um, and I'm so curious, like, as you work with people and you see things come up that are career related, um, what are some of the most common things that you see come up that are maybe 
tough for people to adjust to or uh, learn as they're kind of, you know, trying to be pro-social and, and develop as individuals in their career? I think there's a, there's a couple things that come to mind there. I think one thing when it comes to just job searching is that some people uh, really want the immediate results. That's how they're wired is they want to be able to, you know, go on Indeed, uh, click, and then hear back right away. And then the idea that it's going to be more of a process, that there's going to be a lot that goes out there. Um, it's going to be sometimes be a wait. Sometimes it doesn't make a whole lot of sense about how long or how um, long it takes for some people to get back to you. So I think there's, um, there's that's, that's definitely a big source of concern. I think that uh, it's, it's also just dealing with um, uh, just a lot of the uncertainties in general about when you're really in the mix of this, about trying to figure out exactly what it is that you want to do. So a lot of it is also clarifying and trying to fine tune, because with Indeed, it's so easy to just click and click and click. And then to think a little bit more about what is it that I want to try to target more for myself? And, you know, try to think about what matches up with me. So that's another thing is trying to clarify a sense like of values and what is most important and what really is meaningful to you that you want to try to target. So it's kind of like the, the uncertainty and knowing also where to begin, you know, sometimes with, with a lot of that or just feeling paralyzed with so many different options. And I think also trying to like maximize a little bit about what might make sense that can really be the best, best match for how you work as a person. That's awesome. And I think that part of knowing your values, that's something that's so difficult for folks, especially when they're in transition. Um, Because sometimes, you know, our values are, we we don't sit down and analyze our values. We maybe adopt values from childhood, from family. We adopt values from our company. Every company has a value statement now, right? And, you know, especially with what's going on in the world right now, a lot of people have lost their jobs, have been laid off have maybe lost the structures that they relied on for their value systems. Um, so how do you sort of work with folks and help them discover their own, you know, unique values, as, uh, you know, outside of all the different things that are around them? Yeah, it's, it's tricky because I think that a lot of times when it comes to um, anxiety or depression or, you know, any, any number of issues is that there can be kind of a remoteness from our values. And I think sometimes it can be, um, maybe portrayed as an ambiguous process or values is kind of an abstract term. Um, so a lot of times it can be about um, thinking about what types of things that you've done in the past or certain areas where when you were doing that, it, it tapped into something. There was something that you were involved with and then trying to fine tune a little bit, like when you were involved in doing this or when you, you know, notice even in a job that you didn't really like, there might've been an aspect of it that really seemed to appeal to you and to take that as a nugget and then trying to expand upon that of like, what were the themes in there? You know, what was it about that that really got you going and that was able to um, try to like, try to try to it got something out of you and I, I think it's also not going to be anything um like there's there's going to be no job that's ultimately like the ideal job like that that is like the the magic pill um but a lot of it is just trying to understand among all the muck of all the different jobs or things you've done in the past that, that like what's underlying that what are the variables that are in there that really kind of got you going or that really seem to um kind of gets you into a spot where you felt challenged, but not too challenged, so that you were really able to constantly kind of expand what you thought you were capable of doing. And then in the job search, it's in trying to find out, instead of kind of getting really stuck on the outcome of like the actual job title, it's like, what's involved in this job? What kind of things would you be doing here? And how, um, how is that going to match up with what things you've done before? So sometimes it's really breaking it down into the nitty gritty of like, because uh, it's so easy just to get fixated on just the, uh, uh, the categorization or how it, how it pops up on, on a website that it's really thinking about how, what is this going to, what's this job going to make me do? Like what kind of things am I going to really be involved with? And that's where, you know, a lot of times when it comes to behaviors and thought patterns that that's where, where I come in to be able to, to help to process some of that. That's awesome. And I really like how you called out the positives in jobs that you maybe didn't like so much. Right. Cause um, what's interesting to me is, you know, anytime a job ends, it ends for a variety of reasons, whether you left on your own because things started getting boring or they plateaued or you had a bad boss or whatever the thing might be. But so often our final maybe week 
of experiences with something can color years of positivity with a negative tone in our mind. It's kind of like you go on vacation and the flight home is terrible. And so the whole vacation is terrible rather than just that one moment. And being able to go back to even roles that weren't a great fit. I, as you're saying that, I'm thinking back to some roles and being like, there were nuggets in there that I, <laughs> that I really enjoyed. I should really For go sure. back and revisit those. That's great. Um, and I think part of this is, from what I see with folks, is this gap between living in our heads and in our imagination and living in the reality of working and, and building a career and, and doing the adulting that everyone talks about, right? Um, where someone will be like, well, I imagine a career in, ad- let's say, advertising looks like Mad Men because I watch it on TV. But then you get that job and it's totally different. It's a lot of email. And, you know, they didn't have email in the 50s and 60s, did they? And so um, I, I'd love to explore that idea a little bit with you and get a, a sense of what you see in your practice between the lives we live in our minds and the realities that we live in and how people might be disconnected between the two. Yeah, that, that's a really, really good good theme, and it comes up a lot. And as soon as you were uh, describing a little bit before, like how you might have envisioned something and how it turns out, immediately the first thing that comes to mind for me just personally is I remember in college when I was still, because um, for myself, my own career development, like I actually did not go into college thinking like, I want to be a psychologist. I I actually knew that the first thing I wanted to do was I wanted to do college radio. Um, I liked music a lot and I thought it would just be so cool to have my own show. So I was like, well, I know I want to do that and I'll figure out the rest later. I'll figure out as I, as I go. And um, one of the first classes that I took was in um, Egyptology just because, you know, Indiana Jones and I figured it would be awesome. really fun learning about all these tomb raiding experiences. And it's actually just a lot of very detailed uh, stuff about ancient history and, you know, specific times that we found out that this dynasty was actually a year or two longer than we thought, like, you know, a lot of those erudite details. I was like, wait a second, this isn't really <laughs> what I thought it would be. Um, but for me, that was especially with, you know, kind of being on my own, one of the, one of those early experiences of like, yeah, sometimes the way I envision or I, I personally will build up something doesn't right quite match with reality. Yeah. And so that's something that takes a lot of different shapes and forms in all sorts of different people. Uh, that that I work with. And I think it's not only the um, particular job itself, sometimes it's the idea of a job. Because one of the first um, people I worked with when I came to Chicago, um, uh, she was doing a job search. And one of the um, themes that came up a lot was, I just need to find a job. If I find a job, that's going to fix everything. Because right now, my whole problem is that I don't have something to do. And it was interesting. It was when I would say like, well, you know, wait a second, but if you get a job, there's probably going to be some other stressors or other things. And it'll be like, no, 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 just need to find a job. That's, that's <laughs> all I got to do. And, and then we're going to be fine. So then, you know, a little while later, it was that, you know, she found a job, but it turns out that, yeah, there were other complications. And so I think that that's something that comes up quite a bit is just this idea of like, if I just find the right combination, I find the right job, or I find, you know, once I get something going there, it's going to fix everything that's like a big thing that comes up is this like, uh, is that that's going to be the magic um, combination of items of everything in my life. And then that's going to be that when instead the real thing I try to work on there is recognizing that doesn't exist. Like instead it's going to be learning how to adapt and improvise to, you know, whatever you're given. Like it's going to be ultimately like a phrase I'll say is that there's, there's jobs that are complicated and have all sorts of things that you don't like and drama that you have to deal with. And there's no jobs because no matter what you're going to get, there's going to be some level of, of that that you have to try to adapt to. So, you know, it's really, I think, then the idea of like, it kind of goes back to some of the uncertainty stuff that we were saying before is that it's not going to be totally laid out. It's not going to be an absolute slam dunk. It's really just learning how to deal with some of the mess and deal with some of the noise and recognize that that can be there and you can have all those difficult emotions that come with it. You can still have a good experience at the job. You know, it's that there's kind of a myth that's portrayed in our culture that if you're experiencing distress, if you're experiencing something that like is stressful, you're doing something wrong. And instead, it's like, that's a very natural consequence that can happen when you're doing all sorts of stuff that are job related and and otherwise. And it's becomes instead of trying to prevent or avoid feeling that, 
how do you still work with that when it shows up? How do you still be able to make something of it and do something that can be values consistent, that can actually feel really good and align yourself with what you want to be doing? That's so great. Yeah, this idea that we're supposed to not feel discomfort and that we're, things are supposed to be easy, I think is so interesting. Um, and I hear that too all the time. As soon as I get a job, all my problems are solved. And I just go, no, you're trading one set of problems for a different set of problems because everyone that I coach who has a job is complaining about their boss or complaining about their yeah. commute or is compl- I guess no commutes anymore. But um, that concept of, um, in my mind, the way I thought about it, or may, you know, maybe I read this in a self-help book or something, but it's a, what problems are worth the effort? Um, and thinking about it in that way, it's like, oh, wait a second, there's always a problem but which problems are worth contending with? And that has helped me throughout my career realize like, you know, the problems that I have in this job aren't even the problems that I want to be having. Like there, I do want to have problems to work on things to solve things to keep me motivated and interested, but not in my case, data related problems. I want to have people related problems. And, and so that shift from that data marketing to that uh, people coaching has been a real big Uh, realization for me as an individual. And I think that that's the kind of, um, you know, thinking that helps people transition slowly from one, one idea to the next, rather than getting stuck in this kind of binary thinking of it's either perfect or it's all crap or it's perfect or it's all crap. And that, you know, you see it in relationships, you see it in family dynamics, you see it everywhere. It's like, it all kind of plays in to, it, it sort of weaves together, right? And so how do you sort of see that binary thinking come up in other ways in, in the people that you work with? Sure. So there's, um, there's a whole subset of things that are called cognitive distortions, where your mind can you know, portray things a certain way. And what you're talking about, the binary representation is that's kind of all or none thinking. It's either all good and everything, everything's great. Right. That's the way it, it's perceived. It seems that way, or it's all bad. And so it can be, in some ways, really exploring that it's a continuum, that the, the way that you're representing this uh, just as a variable is, is off. Like, and, and it's working to shift and to understand that things are, they're more on a scale. There's a lot of shades of gray uh, uh, than that. So that's, that's something that I definitely try to, try to work with quite a bit. Um, because I think, again, it kind of goes down to this uh, thing where a lot of people that I work with, that especially that have um, anxiety, tend to be very analytical thinkers. You know, they tend to be thinking, um, and that's why in some ways they can be experiencing a lot of great success at their jobs or different things is because they just are able to mobilize, think through problems and think like, okay, we have an issue. How do we fix it? How do we do this or that? But when it comes to emotions or uncertainty, there's no fixing. And you can't take that quite binary approach of like, what's the thing I do to make this go away? And that's a big jump that comes for a lot of people is because, you know, we're hardwired in general with discomfort is you you pop a pill, you do something to deal with some kind of discomfort, you find the thing that makes it go away. But you can't make a lot of these feelings just just disappear. You know, you have to find different ways to be able to relate or to kind of work with them a little bit differently. So that kind of binary representation that you're talking about, it's huge. It really comes out a lot. And I think a lot of people, you know, I mean, sometimes binary, the zeros and ones, you think about people in computer science or, you know, those that are very analytic in their thinking, and that works for a lot of different things and it's taken them a long ways, but you have to shift gears and you have to take a little bit of a different approach when it comes to emotions and a lot of other life stuff too. It doesn't quite fit that way. And with anxiety in particular, um, it's something that I've dealt with, uh, you know, all throughout my life. And, and uh, I, what you're saying really makes sense. And it's what it's the process I've gone through as well of, you know, not trying to get rid of it, or, or hide from it, or whatever the thing is that we're trying to do, and more so accepting it and improvising in response to it. But what are some of those, let's say, strategies, because I've, I've said this to people where I'm like, Oh, yeah. Well, the anxiety in your life is never going to go away necessarily. You're just going to sort of have it be there as kind of like, I think so. I've heard someone describe it as like, it's in the backpack and it pops out every once in a while. I'm like, oh, hey, you're still here. Um, but yeah. what, what do you see as like some of the best ways to think about it or conceptualize it or maybe uh, in, in order to be able to live with it? What have you seen work best with folks? 
Yeah, I like I like your your backpack metaphor. I mean, I'm, I'm very, very big on metaphors, and sometimes it can be just trying to find the best representation. You know, other times it can be like more of the file cabinet. You know, metaphors. You want to just kind of get everything all filed away, and then you know when this anxiety thing keeps popping up, like it just you can't quite close the drawer. You know, it just it just is is still there. So yeah, a lot of times it really kind of comes down to just having a different type of relationship with this. Um, there's in terms of like a for a brief history with cognitive behavioral therapy is that it started off like earlier in the 20th century, kind of more in the 50s and 60s uh, around just behaviors and, you know, behavioral modification, what we can do to reinforce certain things or, you know, add negative reinforcement uh, to help shape behaviors. And then a little bit later on, it became about taking a look at the cognitions, you know, a lot of the patterns in our thinking. And a lot of people like um, uh, Aaron Beck, uh, Martin Seligman, who wrote a lot about, about this and optimism, um, those, th that became a big part of cognitive behavioral therapy and sort of the, the second wave, so to speak, of research. And then more recently, there's been this third wave of cognitive behavioral therapy, which is very much focused on acceptance and also brings in themes of mindfulness. Now, mindfulness is a very overused term these days. If you kind of go to any grocery store checkout center, like on the cover of all the magazines, you'll see mindfulness in you, mindfulness here, this and uh, that, mindfulness in yoga. So it's all over. But what really that, that comes down to is the idea of changing up the relationship you have with your inner experience, especially the trickier, more difficult emotions, where instead of just trying to get rid of them or if something gets stuck in the backpack of the file cabinet just trying to push it down or throw it out it's how do you understand and develop a different approach that's more accepting knowing that it's going to pop up but knowing what its patterns are and knowing how you can adapt and work around with it um, a common expression i'll say with this is that when it comes to anxiety it really comes down to addition or subtraction and most people are trying to do a subtraction approach they're trying to do get rid. They're trying to just remove this. And that's just going to get you nowhere. You're going to go round and round with it because it's part of your brain. It's part of how you operate. And you can't just take it out. It's like trying to remove flour from a cake after you've baked it. It's, it's already in the, in the batter. It's in the mix. So instead, you have to add some new stuff. You have to add a new approach to be able to work with the anxiety, to accept that it's going to be there. It's going to pop up. But how do you work around it? How do you do some things to not feed into it as much? And again, try to really focus on the more values consistent behaviors that you want to activate more and do. That's really what it comes down to. That's incredible. And one of the ways that I've, uh, speaking of metaphors, conceptualized it, um, in my mind, I use kind of a, an orchestra picture. I, I have an orchestra of all the different emotions playing different instruments. And sometimes some are way too loud and I'm supposed to be in the conductor seat, uh, you know, trying to lead the orchestra. I have them work in harmony together, but very often I'll find myself in the audience watching this orchestra play and just being like, whoa, those emotions are going crazy. And sometimes I'll see like, uh, I'll see anxiety run up and just take the conductor seat. And then he's just like, everyone's loud today. And, and th that kind of like imagery and, and whether it's uh whether it's saying, you know, get back into that conductor seat and actually talking myself like and visualizing myself getting back into that seat or, or let's say it's a, a, a metaphor of a car, like get, if, if anxiety is driving the car, can you pull over and change seats or something like that? And like literally going through it in my mind, I find those metaphors to be really helpful um, in sort of contextualizing it as part of your brain rather than your whole thing. And I think this leads into the idea of emotions right a lot of times people say i am depressed or i am anxious versus i'm feeling depressed or i'm feeling anxious and that embodying the full emotion um, versus being able to say i'm feeling a dozen different things and this one's the loudest how have you sort of seen that or what are what are the best practices from from you know your teachings of how to identify with or relate to emotions. Yeah, well, I really like your orchestra metaphor. That's, that's, that's definitely pretty good. It really actually uh, is largely related to another one I'll often do, which probably comes from my, my time on the radio. If I think of like, a, like an audio mixing board, of adjusting nice. the different volume levels and how, how loud certain things are. And sometimes what can happen is the, 
certain emotions, the anxiety section, the volume is turned way up on there. So instead, it's like we can't get rid of that. We can't totally do it, but we can adjust the volumes. And sometimes it can be about reducing the anxiety. There might be some things that you can do to be able to like, you know, bring the volume level down there. Other times it might be, you might be limited with that. You can only do that so much, but you can up the volume on some other areas too that can comparatively help to balance things out. That's, that's another aspect that can be done in conjunction. And when some people get really, really fixated on, I have to reduce my anxiety, I have to get rid of my anxiety. Is it gone now? Or is, is it, what's, what's going on with that? Then sometimes it can be about focusing on some of those other, um, those other volume levels. But a lot of times then, the mixing board is just one, one example of this. But, you know, it, a lot of times it's just developing with whatever language, you know, somebody is, is, is bringing to me to help to understand how they do experience emotions. And that's where I try to just like really take in and listen what the experience is like, what they're doing, what is not working. Um, try to understand the distress, you know, of just what, what it is to be locked in this pattern. But usually one of the overarching patterns is that there is just so much energy that's being done to try to get rid of something, to try to say, this is bad. And there's a lot of judgment that's also mm -hmm. going in there is that from having this, this is bad. This is no good. And I want to get rid of this. And instead it's like, okay, well that, that's really not working. You know, that, that approach there is not really adding up to anything for you. So let's try to think a little bit about how to relate to this in, in a different way where it's about, you know, trying to in some ways, give it a name or try to understand that this is part of the experience. It's a valid thing that's going to happen, but what can we do with this to make sure that it's, we can recontextualize it. We can have it be a little bit of a different understanding or a different approach that you can take with it. I mean, a common one I'll use um, that I can actually think of from earlier this week is if you were throwing a birthday party and somebody that you weren't really a big fan of shows up at the party. And, you know, it's, it's somebody where, you know, you're like, okay, they're there, but you don't want to make a scene and you don't want to, you know, get into it with the person and say, what are you doing here? Cause then they're going to get upset. You get upset. It becomes a big thing. And then the party is, you know, it just uh, almost doesn't happen because there's, there's so much drama that's going on. So instead that person is anxiety. That person is whatever emotion that that's there. So you can acknowledge them. You don't want to also spend, do this, try to spend all your time ignoring them is that you can acknowledge like, Oh, Hey, yeah, I see. Yeah, you're here. Cool. But they're going to go off and they're going to do their thing and you do your thing and you kind of work to coexist. You sort of, uh, cohabitate in a way with this emotion when it, when it comes up. So that's just another example of, of something that will, will come just to have like a different understanding of what this person is rather than being locked in some kind of conflict that doesn't go anywhere is to develop a different sort of approach that allows you to connect with it in a different way and ultimately allows to freeze things up so that you can be able to, you know, do different things that are meaningful to you that you want to be doing. The idea of cohabitation is, is so interesting to me. It's uh. It, it is. It's like not trying to hide or leave the room or run away or, or even be confrontational, just kind of acknowledging. And, and that, I think, also comes to the moral judgment piece that you mentioned, because when we're going through the job search and, you know, trying to grow in our lives, in our personal and professional lives, I find a lot of times people look at different behaviors or different things that happen. Let's say you get rejected or someone just doesn't respond to an email you sent, right? And there is so much more weight put on it than it probably ever deserved or needed, right? A, a good example of this might be, you know, probably six months ago, I sent an email to someone and didn't get a response. And I was like, uh oh, did I do something wrong in that interaction? Uh, well, whatever, moving on with my day because I've spent so many years, you know, learning how not to fret over those things. Um, and then like three months later, they responded and they were like, oh my gosh, I never checked that email. I'm so sorry. And I'm like, I'm so glad I didn't go down a spiral with that because I see it all the time where we'll take something that if we had security in our lives, potentially, and this is, again, going back to that binary thinking, well, if I had a job, I could network so easily. But I think these emotions come up all the time, even, even when we feel secure. But that, um, that sort of overemphasizing or putting too much emotion into something that should probably be fairly benign or fairly emotionless, um, and, and 
I, I'm trying to think about what that might be from a, more of a psychological perspective. I mean, obviously rejection hurts and, and getting a job is something that stresses people out, but is there something deeper going on there? Is there something from a psychological perspective of like where we put attention or how we focus attention and, and how that might be misaligned or something? I'm kind of curious what your thoughts are on that topic. Yeah, I think a lot of it is um, a, a big um, thing I try to do is that it's it's how we allocate our attention, you know, what we choose to really give the attention to in a lot of different aspects of our experience. And when you have a lot of attention that's going into either anxiety and all the hypothetical stuff that could happen in the future, what about this, what about that, that really reinforces it, you know, that makes it a lot stronger. And then also sometimes kind of as, as you're talking about, it can be about the threat of rejection and the idea of like, well, what if this doesn't work out? What if um, they don't get back to me? What if I'm just, you know, left here, you know, waiting further for this to happen? So sometimes when people build that up and they give all this attention to a scenario, I, I've been using the phrase uh, more recently in the, um, uh, the iPhone era of like uh, of autocomplete. Is that like in some ways that you have an autocompleted future that all of a sudden when you start thinking about it, you know, it kind of gets into that, like that fuzzy thing where it's, it's, it's almost like actually entered on your screen, but it's about to, like it gets activated, like it's there and it's about ready to go. And then because you see that you're like, Oh, like uh, that could happen. And I, I just can't do it. I, I can't apply to this job. I can't follow through with this because I saw the potential version of all the bad stuff that could happen there. Um, and just like with, um, with uh, the, that auto-completing thing is that you can actually choose to type something else and then that just kind of goes away and you're able to create another narrative there. But instead, some people, because just that idea of rejection or just that it's such a like a hot emotion that they just kind of immediately back away from, uh, then that, that becomes the default response. And the problem with that when you're avoiding a lot of that is then you don't have a whole lot of evidence to the contrary. You know, you're not able to actually show yourself when you do follow through that this is actually what can happen. Sometimes it goes well, sometimes it can be a waiting game and other times it could be a rejection, but it's ultimately going to be kind of a mixed bag probably. So it's kind of working to not just operate on this uh, more fear-based mentality of everything that could happen and develop an openness and more, again, more of an acceptance-based approach that, yep, all these things could happen, but really what, what's driving me? What should be about the engine that's, that's, uh, that's directing my actions? Is it the the, the uncertainty is that the all the anxiety about the hypotheticals or do I want it to be more like what what you value and that this idea of like no regardless of what happens I want to be able to say that I at least applied to that job I love that and there's you've got me thinking about a, a, a kind of a deep question I think which is um you know back when I my anxiety disorder was at its full full like strength it just really getting me um, I really couldn't picture a future that didn't have it, right? Like I figured there are just people who don't have anxiety and then there's people like me. And one of the things that I'm really curious to learn from you is, so let's say someone is in the job search and they're incredibly anxious and every day they just kind of pop off their pillow with those morning fears and check an email and like go to bed with the Sunday scaries and, and all the different things that come along with it. Um, and they really can only imagine one future. It's, it's, it's a future that's unattainable, which is a anxiety-free future where I wake yeah. up and I never, ever for the rest of my life feel anxiety. That's kind of that binary thinking. And they really can't picture what a healthy relationship with your anxiety would be. Because I, honestly, if you have zero, 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 zero anxieties, you might walk into some bad situations <laughs> unprepared. So that might not even be good. It's like not being able to feel pain, right? You know, you got those bond villains starting to happen. Um, so there's this kind of a two part question. The first part is how much can people actually change? Because when people come to me, they, they come, to, and I'm sure with you, they come with a lot of limiting beliefs already really set in stone. Um, whether or not they're introverted or able to network or do the, a whole bunch of different things. So how much are people able to change? And in what time period have you seen like changes be able to be made? And then, and obviously there's no one answer for this, but 
And then what would a healthy relationship with anxiety look like if maybe you have an example of someone who's done a good job responding to it? Um, I'll, I'll pause there and, and let you take the question where you want to. That is a pretty deep question. Um, I, I, it's, it's all good. I actually, I think there's a lot of really uh, good, uh, good points in here. So I think first off, I just have to say that um, anxiety, the reason we have it is that there's a function to it, as you were alluding to, is that if we did not have anxiety, we'd be in big trouble. Like we've inherited anxiety over, you know, millions of years with evolution wise. It's just because um, that is something that does work to keep us safe. Like it, it just like how our, you know, uh, sort of Neanderthal ancestors had anxiety to be able to think about uh, fear responses or that there could be something threatening that's around. That's part of what kept them alive. Like if we didn't have this part of our brain, uh, kind of more in the, in the center of the brain, we wouldn't look both ways when we cross the street. We wouldn't be able to detect threats. And so we really do need this around. So a lot of times when somebody comes in with a limited belief of like, yeah, I really just got to get rid of this anxiety thing or this idea of like, no one else seems to have anxiety. I just have anxiety. So I, I just got to, I just got to cut this out. Like, can we, you know, like they're not literally saying this, but they're almost like, can we just remove this part of my brain or can we yeah. just like zap this out? Like, or almost like that movie, um, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless yes. Mind. Can we just go through and take that out and then just like, it's not even there. And it's like, well, first off, no, we can't. And second of all, if we did that, um, yeah, you'd, you'd be in a lot of trouble. Like you wouldn't be able to actually, you know, be able to, to function without anxiety, without that part of your brain. That's kind of what keeps you thinking ahead and being able to like detect like what kind of things you need to be considering. Sometimes you need that part of your nervous system to rev things up before you're doing something like a test or, you know, a presentation or whatever to be able to kind of mobilize things. So you really, you really do uh, need all of this. So, you know, instead it just becomes about, uh, I think I used this term before, but it's about recontextualizing, you know, what this, what this means. Because if you, there, there is ultimately like one person I can think of that has uh, no anxiety whatsoever. And that's somebody who's not alive. Like that's, that's the, that's, that's an example, a little dramatic, but it's that sometimes I love that. Give, is that is that like, well, there's brains that have anxiety and then there's brains that are not alive because to be functional and to have everything going, it means that you're going to have emotions and, uh, and anxiety and all the rest that also, that, that also comes with it. So instead it becomes very much about knowing how your anxiety works how it pops up. And this kind of gets into the second thing you were saying, about how much can people really change? You know, how much can you really expect? And that's, that's a little tricky. I think there's, you know, there's some different schools of thought on this. Um, and to me, it's like, this is something where, um, you know, most psychologists have a default answer to a lot of these types of questions, which is, uh, it depends. Mm -hmm. And that is in part my, my answer here is it really does depend a little bit on the person. It depends on some factors like willingness like this idea of that, are you really, if you really want to try to change, so just for instance, like how much you network, if you have a limited belief of like, I don't network, I don't really do that. Then if you continue to reinforce that, and then you're not implementing behaviors, then guess what? You have kind of shown yourself through the lack of action that, yeah, you are, you are officially somebody who is not networking now. But if instead you have an idea, just as an example of like, well, I, I don't exactly like like networking, but I kind of have to do it. And what if I had an adjusted approach where I had some specific goals of like, not my favorite thing, but I have these two times a month, I reach out to somebody or I actually follow through with, with doing this. And it's not because I'm like a networking person, I'm doing a networking related behavior that I'm putting in the mix. And it's almost like an experiment. It's like, what if I just put that in there and I see how it works, I see actually as I move forward that, hey, you know, actually this is, um, this is kind of okay. I, I, there's some parts of this that I kind of like, or there's some aspects that, that do fit what I do. So a lot of it is that it's, it's not about getting too focused on the outcome or the finished product of what type of person I am. That's always in flux. And it's a big thing, I think, a, a lot in, in therapy is understanding that nobody has it all figured out. We're all works in progress. We're all in the process of just trying to see what exactly we, we're made of, what we like to do. There, and a lot of people get fused with this idea of this is the person I am. And it's trying to ultimately implement a little bit more from a curiosity standpoint, what else you can try out, what else you can try to do, what ends up fitting and how you can continue to evolve. 
but understanding that there's going to be some limitations so that somebody who wasn't a fan of networking is not going to be making this the center point of their career, but it could be a little bit more of a side thing that they, that they have, or they're able to implement it in different kinds of ways. Yeah. I love that. Cause I was someone who uh, used to have like panic attacks with networking and oddly enough have made it the center of my career. But um, I really like what you're saying here with focus or don't focus on the outcome and recontextualize. Because I do think that I see a lot of times someone will be like, I don't like networking. And then it's their homework for their boot camp or whatever it is that they're in that they have to do it. So they go do it begrudgingly the same way like if a parent was telling you to go, you know, call your grandma or something like that. You're like, oh, I'm in a bad mood on this phone call. And then all of a sudden you're, re- you're actually bringing to life the, the fear that you have, right? If you go into networking with a, I'm not good at this attitude, and then it goes poorly because we went in with that super negative view, we're reinforcing that we're not good at it. And then we're going to be more scared to do it again, rather than this might not go well, this might go well, who knows, but it doesn't really matter because it's more about the action uh, than, than anything else. Um, and this idea of recontextualizing how we enter into things, I think is really helpful. And so I want to shift back to the real core of what we're talking about here, which is how uncertain everything is in the world right now. Like the job search is uncertain normally, and it's even more uncertain due to layoffs and COVID and, and all the different stuff that's happening in the world. Like we're, we're uncertain just who to even trust with the news. We're uncertain who to even trust with whether, you know, certain things are safe to touch or not to touch in the world. Right. So there's a lot of uncertainty going on. Um, And so when, when you think about the uncertainty of the world in, and this process of recontextualizing, you know, I've seen folks like stop watching the news during their job search in order to keep themselves somewhat calm. I've seen people do a lot of different um, behaviors, but what are maybe some of the recontextualization strategies that we might be able to apply in such uncertain times kind of more broadly? You know, in, in a lot of ways, you know, I feel like, um, you know, I, like everybody, I'm still figuring that out myself because a lot of the stuff we took for granted, um, you know, just uh, with our daily routines is so altered. So right now, you know, if the question comes, I've been working remotely and doing sessions via Zoom or FaceTime or whatever. And uh, if the question comes, so when are you going to be, you know, back in the office? It's like, well, I, uh, we have to see how it goes for right now. It's want to be as, as safe as possible. So even just those basic things before uh, they come under fire where it's, it's, re- it's really, it's really tough to know. So the, the one thing is, is I think to be careful about is that I try to also um, share that with other people is to say that like, cause I think as you were saying before, there can be that feeling of, well, everyone else has this figured out or everyone else has certainty, but I don't, there must be something up with me. And instead it's like, no, no, no we're all dealing with this uncertainty right now. There's all the uncertainty that we had that we were bringing to the table already. And then there was a collective huge amount of uncertainty that was then dumped on top of that. And that's a lot of weight. So in some ways it's about, you know, working to empathize and to really say that this is again, not something that we just try to fix. That's it's, it's not going to work here, but it becomes more of this idea of adaptability. And I think that the phrase that I've used probably the most, I was using this a lot earlier in the pandemic, is that there's so much focus on the macro about when is this going to get back to normal? When is that? Or on a societal level, like when is when are things going to go back to normal? And I remember there was a phrase also uh, in conjunction with that, uh, when this is all over, mm. I'm going to do this. Like that was used a lot. So like when this is all over, I'm going to get a haircut. When this is all over, I'm going to do this. And then I think we've come to this thing of like, yeah, there's not going to be a definitive binary uh, thing going back to that term again, is that it's not like, okay, COVID is officially over now. It, I, it's not going to be something like that. So instead, it goes back to this continuum thing is saying like, well, I have to try to a- adapt to this uh, a little bit differently. And the best way to adapt instead of focusing on all the macro stuff is the micro, like thinking about your life is that, okay, so here's what I have going on right now. What can I do with my routine? What are even some small steps? Because when I ever, whenever I get stuck or I get stuck kind of in this larger situation, I get real behavioral because we can't really change how we feel 
we really can't. Like we're going to feel how we're going to feel. Our brain is going to just dish out the emotions and that's just how you feel. Yeah. And you really can't change up a whole lot what you think. Because sometimes, you know, you can, you can sort of be able to recognize some of the patterns in your thinking and, and change it to some extent. But in large part, you're just going to have some thoughts that pop up. But your behaviors, that's what you can work with. That's the kind of thing that when you're thinking on a more micro level with all this uncertainty, I can still change up what I'm doing with my daily routine, what I'm, what I'm doing right now. What kind of things do I want to try to implement in more? And yeah, you see that a lot, of course, with different people when they're doing things like, um, this is what, uh, this is what I baked today. This is the kind of bread I made. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of other types of like probably Instagram type trends that have been going on with that. But yeah, that's just like one example of those are what people are actively working to do. And sometimes it can also be with um, job strategies to, uh, stuff too, of, of like trying to think of what else is out there that you might want to apply for, or what else is um, going on some other areas. But it's really just kind of get getting down to the micro level and thinking on a more behavioral standpoint of like, what can I be doing now? What are some small steps I can take? Yeah, that's that routine piece is so important for folks to, to really focus on, I think, because, well, there, the two things that you said there, the one is you know, therapists are human, coaches are human. We were going through all this stuff at the same time. Like I, I know at one point I uh, burnt out on Zoom calls. I was like, gosh, I, I've been doing Zoom for years and I'm burning out on Zoom calls. I can't imagine how other people are feeling. Um, and this idea of routine is actually something I've had to implement as well, trying to figure out how to work out and bring meditation into things because, you know, being at home, by choice is how I used to be. And now being home because I have to is a totally different. It's funny. It's the same experience, but it's a different experience, if, if that makes any sense. Yeah, um, I got you. And so what are maybe some of the routines? Let's say someone's about to, you know, they're starting to feel that anxiety well up. They're starting to feel those, those thoughts and those feelings um, overtake them. Um, are there any like really really nice sort of basic routines that they could start implementing that would help alleviate or, or manage um, that experience? Yeah. So I, I think when it comes to the anxiety and thinking about different routines or go-to strategies there, I think it also depends on the level of anxiety that somebody's experiencing. And I kind of have sort of, you know, temperature style readings is that if you're in the red, so if you're in a, on a scale of uh, one to 10, if you're eight or above, and there's just a ton of anxiety that has got you physically dysregulated, um, you can't really think your way out of that. So in mm -hmm. some ways, if you're really feeling amped up, or if there are times of your day or certain situations when you get that amped up, you kind of have to do something physical to be able to calm yourself down. And that can be anything from figuring out exercise or even just being able to kind of separate to take a walk or run or showering or whatever it is to be able to have like something physical stimulation based uh, that can be able to bring you out of the red. That's one thing that can be added to the routine. But if it's more in the moderate end where I think of that as being, you know, just anxiety that's kind of got you restless and it's really tough to get out of your mind. Um, that's when sometimes you want to try to do some different strategies just to be able to acknowledge and work to kind of shift your focus away from that. So sometimes that could be, uh, you know, even writing down what, sh what, what it is that you're feeling and being able to delay immediately acting on it and just saying, I have all this stuff that's on my mind. I'm going to put it down. I can revisit it later. That way I haven't forgotten it. It's all there, but I can kind of sort through a little bit later what's most important for me to do. Um, you know, other times it depends on the source of the anxiety, but sometimes it might just be whatever you can do to uh, not ignore it or not avoid the, what, what's going on, but also not to feed into it too much. I, I think that anxiety is something that can be as strong as how much you are, you know, you are really having it go round in different cycles in your, in your mind. If you got to go round and round, it's going to feel stronger. So it's going to be about working to not... Uh, fall into that pattern quite as much or just be able to kind of recognize and give a name of like, yeah, I'm cycling right now. When I cycle like this, I got to, I got to shift it up. I got to do something a little bit different. I got to get my mind on something else and I can revisit this later when there isn't as much cycling. And uh, then sometimes that can, um, uh, that can really make a difference. And if it's just like a little bit of some lower level of anxiety, just feeling a little restless, that's sometimes where some of the old tried and true strategies, like, you know, 
the deep breathing, or you know, maybe you kind of just uh, turn on Headspace or a similar app just to be able to uh, to meditate for a little bit. And that sometimes can help just to kind of recenter yourself. But I always hesitate sometimes with some of the more meditation based or some of those kind of strategies uh, when the anxiety is is more in the upper end of things. Uh, the last thing you want to do when you're having a, a, a rush of thoughts and tons of anxiety is like, I'm going to sit with this. <laughs> that can be a little a little too intense. So it's like, let's do some things to bring it down. And then like maybe a little bit later, you can you can kind of work to sit or reflect. But it's all a matter of, of timing, I think, when it comes to that. I love how you broke that out with the different levels and the different types of responses. I think sometimes when we are seeking help with anxiety, we just kind of jump to, you know, the the top five things you can do to reduce your anxiety article. And maybe you're, yeah, maybe you're trying to use meditation when you should be using a run, or maybe you're trying to, you know, go, you're, you're trying to fix too, too extreme of an emotion with too small of a, 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 a solution. And, and if you study meditation, like, you know, they'll even say, I was reading Hardcore Zen, and he was saying, you know, if you think meditation is going to calm you down, you might not be meditating, right? Because <laughs> it might uh, very much amp you up because you have to face your yourself and face your thoughts. So I love that you put that out there. Um, when it comes to, and, and we're getting to the end here, when it comes to um, therapy, coaching, self-reflection, all these different things, right? Like people can journal, People can, you know, watch videos online, kind of talking about the different stages of help that people might need at different points in, in their life, in their career, in their anxiety, in their, in their different experiences and emotions. We talk about coaching a lot of career therapy, but we really encourage people to go see therapists as well. Um, I think it's incredibly helpful um, in, in your personal life and your career and everything. And so you know, if, if someone is thinking, should I see a coach right now or should I see a therapist right now? Um, what are some things that they might want to reflect on or think about when making that decision? Yeah, that's, that's a tricky question because actually a lot of times, um, especially for younger folks I work with, I will introduce myself as a, a form of coach. Oh, is cool. that just like a coach is able to tell you, like, here's some strategies or things that you can do or ways to improve your performance, you know, there's an aspect of that that I do that is, you know, pretty congruent with a coach. I think, though, is that I can be able to switch it up beyond that as well. If we want to actually, you know, just really kind of just work to sit with some emotions or just kind of be able to hear through some other stuff and have it not be like immediately and what's the game plan, you know, that's something that also can be in the psychologist or therapist wheelhouse as well. Uh, so I think a coach can be if you have some really specific areas, like especially maybe like with professional development, you're like, yeah, I really want to fine tune these. I think a coach could actually be a very nice fit there. But if, it, if it's a little bit more ambiguous and you're like, well, I got these, but there's a lot of stuff with myself and a lot of my own emotions that can kind of hijack things, or there's a lot of stuff I don't totally understand about what's getting me so stuck. That's a little bit more in my realm because whenever there's that ambiguity and just these, everything seems out of focus here. And I want to try to get that in focus more then yeah, that can definitely be something that uh, where I come in to be able to help out with that. And sometimes I think it can almost be like a, uh, I can work in conjunction with a coach. And I've done that kind of thing before where it's like, a, you know, working to that I'm working on certain things and maybe there's a executive coach that's also helping with some other things so that we can all be working together for the same goal. That's super helpful. And, and it's so fun as a coach, you know, uh, I come across the, and this is one of the reasons why it's called career therapy and why I'm so happy to be talking to you is because, you know, I'll be talking to someone and we'll hit a point and I'm like, you know, that's not really a career related thing. That is a much deeper right. thing that you might want to explore with someone who's uh, really, you know, sk uh, you know, trained in that area, whether it's uh, you, all, from anywhere from like a depression, from a divorce to actual suicidal thoughts and things like that. So it's very interesting to see the the multi-layered struggles that people are having when they think it might be their career, but really it's a lot of different things involved. And so uh, it's always a wonderful day for me when I'm chatting with someone in the DMs and they go, you know what, actually, I don't, I don't think it's my job that I need to be focusing on right now. I think it's me and I'm going to go take some time to yeah. figure myself out. And I'm always like, yes, like, that's a great moment. I'm like, that is exactly what I love to hear uh, when it's the you know right time and reflection. Um, so I'm really excited. I'm, I'm glad that you joined the conversation today. I'm excited that folks are getting to hear your perspectives on these things. 
where can they go to find out more about you, your practice, and the things that you like to share? Uh, sure. So, yeah, if you just go to our website, uh, chicagocbtcenter.com, uh, we've got all the information there and more about the practice is pretty, pretty comprehensive. And you can read um, both more about cognitive behavioral therapy and our approach to treatment. You can learn more about myself and the other providers there. Um, and there's also some links to some other organizations that also work with anxiety if you kind of wanted to look a little bit more in there. So there's, there's all sorts of more information on the website if you're interested. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Dan. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. No, it's, it's, been, it's been great great to be here. And I think this final thought, it's always like there's never a finished product, I think, is, is the thing, is that so many people just like, you know, how do I get to this ideal? And a lot of it is just knowing that it's not a thing and it's just working with what you've got. I love it. Thanks for joining us for today's episode. If you found this conversation to be helpful, please like and subscribe wherever you are listening. We also appreciate it if you take the time to leave us a review on iTunes. It really does help us spread the word and get these ideas out to more job seekers looking to build their careers and improve their lives just like you. If you'd like to learn more about career therapy and see our different coaching options, you can head over to careertherapy.com to learn more. Thank you again for stopping by. We wish you all the best in the future of your career. Have a good one.